everyone, welcome to my channel, That's Right, I Homeschool. My name is Mrs. T. Today we have a Q&A. So, before we hop into it, I just wanna say a couple things. One, if I don't answer your question or if you've come up with additional questions, make sure you comment down below so I can answer them and we can start having a conversation. And two, I am not a homeschooling expert. I'm not a parenting expert. I'm just a homeschooling parent. <laughs> so I am going to be giving my opinions, but please keep in mind that we are new in our homeschooling journey, number one. And number two, I only have two young children. So I have an incoming kindergartner and an incoming preschooler, and we only have one year of homeschool under our belt. I am by no means an expert, so make sure that you take what I say not as gospel, it is just a current opinion that fits our current situation. So let's go ahead and hop right into it. First question, um, I'm interested in how to start a routine with a preschooler for the first time. No older siblings to watch or learn from. Should we fit in the learning and activities when they have the attention throughout the day or try to dedicate a set amount of time each day? So I do think this is really going to depend on your family as well as your child. But I will say this is very similar to our situation. We had our oldest who did not have any older siblings and we were hoping to implement homeschooling. For us and what worked best is to have a routine and to have a flow. So for us, it wasn't starting, let's say phonics at a specific time, but having this general flow. So after breakfast, we do X, Y, Z thing. After that, we do go into the next activity, so on and so forth. But for my child, especially for that early time frame, I felt like he benefited the most knowing that each day we are going to cover phonics, math, and handwriting and then only for small amounts of time. So when we started preschool, it was about only five minutes per subject sitting, and we did not do every single subject back to back. We definitely spread it out, but we had a routine in the way that we spread it out. So we created these schedules in the flow, and the flow did change as our schedule changed throughout the year, but we were consistent. We did not flip flop it all the time, and I find consistent and routine worked the best. Um, I found squeezing things in or trying to get extras that w did not fit in our typical flow never really worked out. I felt like consistency was much better for our family and for my child. Question two, what are your thoughts on starting preschool three years old, just three days a week to not overwhelm them? I think that that's a great idea. I mean, if that works for your family, that works for your family and that's perfect. For us, we started with four days and then we moved up to five. And again, we started, the biggest change was not adding the extra day. It was mostly adding additional time per sitting. So we started at about five minutes and we're now up to about um, 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes in a single sitting over the duration of a, the equivalent of a year and a half of school. So May to May, we have been able to increase and that increase was pretty gradual rather than adding additional days. So that's what worked for us, but Easing in through just three days a week, I think is a really brilliant idea as well. If that works for your family, embrace it. <laughs> okay, next question. What's your background or interest in French? What media, songs, videos, etc., have you used to expose your, ch your kids at a young age? So I actually studied French uh, when I was in high school. I went through the whole AP route for French and then my college degree is in languages relating to French and my career is related to French and other languages. So I do have a lot of exposure to French, but I do not count myself as a native speaker. However, practice and exposure to it, I feel like I pick it up very quickly. Now, languages have been a huge part of my life, both French and sign language. And so we have been very um, purposeful with exposing my children to these two languages. So we use baby sign a lot and then also basic signs we still use at home. Um, and then for French, we do a lot of Kaboomers and Cocomelon playlists on Spotify. And I'll list a few actually of others in my description below so you can access those as well. And then we also watch a lot of, um, well not a lot, but we watch TV in French. And for a period of time, if we turn on the television, it had to be in French just to expose my children to it. So we have Disney Plus. So we were watching like Winnie the Pooh in French. We were watching um, Mickey Mouse Clubhouse was a popular one. And there are a lot of things on that platform, for example, that you can toggle the language over to French. 
Louis is even in French as well. So we did just kind of expose my child a lot through that as well as through audiobooks, which there are a lot of free ones um, online, specifically on YouTube as well. Next question. <laughs> How do you schedule school around activities during the day? We like to do story time at the library, but it's mid morning. So we actually put my children into childcare for a couple of hours. And so I actually scheduled very purposefully. They were in childcare while I was focusing on my, my job. And then when I had them, we focused on homeschool and life with them. <laughs> but I will say in the kindergarten year, we are blocking off time. So basically we are going to say our school hours are going to go from morning, from wake up time, whenever we start, to a set time. Um, I'm gonna guess it's probably gonna be 1 p.m. And then the idea here is anything not academic is not going to be scheduled through there. Now, especially in the early years, you mentioned library story time. I would actually consider that to be um, something academically and enriching. So I probably would, wouldn't be afraid to include that activity in my typical homeschooling time. But knowing that on those days, we are going to have to see a little bit of difference. Either we're working a little bit harder, maybe having shorter breaks in between subjects to still finish by our goal, or we expand out that time where we're not going to be scheduling something until maybe 2 or 2.30, whatever it is to capture that um, amount of time. So we are going to be blocking out school. That means no appointments. We can't go cut our hair. <laughs> we can't do anything not academic during school hours. All right, next question. If you were to move and state requirements are stricter, would previous homeschool and records still count or would they need to go back to make up to prove that they know certain topics? And let me just start by saying my biggest recommendation, if you have any questions about homeschooling records and carrying them over to a different state is actually talking to someone. Um, you can choose someone from the district you're currently in or if you know you're going to a specific district before that commitment, part of that moving process, I would definitely contact them to make sure. I'm also going to link down below a resource that does talk about homeschooling laws. That would definitely be a good resource. Again, I highly recommend talking to your current district and as well as your target district if you are going to be moving. Okay, um, any tips on for finding a group, homeschool group, co-op, or anything for younger kids? You mentioned in a video finding a nature-based group that meets every other week. How did you find that? So a lot of it for us have been, has been word of mouth. I was very intentional with, um, and again, I have two younger kids, so it is a little bit different when you have older kids, but I was very intentional to take my younger children to places like library story time, um, parks and nature centers, children's museums, etc., during typical school hours. And we met a lot of homeschooling families by just being in these places that a public school child or a private school child would not be in. Um, but a really good start in what I would recommend doing is talking to your librarian, especially the one in the kids room. They typically ask them, do you know of any homeschooling groups? A lot of homeschooling groups share that information with your library and the librarian might have some good resources for you. But for me, in addition to talking to our librarian, um, we looked up, basically we had a radius and we looked up um, nature centers, state parks, national parks, um, oh gosh, children's museums, even some like adult museums have homeschooling programs. I looked for um, zoos, zoos also have one and aquariums. So looking, starting there and kind of looking to see, just looking if any of those kind of places have homeschooling resources or groups is a good first start. And then um, for us, for me, I actually have not been able to find a co-op. It just doesn't really fit very well. The area that I'm in is very Christian heavy. So all of our co-ops locally that I have found thus far have been Christian based. And I'm really looking for a secular homeschooling group and we just haven't found a co-op like that yet. And at this point in time, um, it's okay because we've met other people, we've connected with other people through these other ways of searching, but that's how I would go about it. And that's how we've gone about it so far. How do you decide which books for the kids are worth buying versus borrowing from the library? Oh, if only I knew the answer to that question. <laughs> 
a huge problem of buying too many books, you guys, both for myself and for my children. So full transparency, I'm probably not the best person to answer this particular question. Um, but I will say from a curriculum perspective, I have definitely have gotten into the habit of looking first to see if the book is at my library. If it does, I have not been purchasing them just because we do have a pretty big um, collection of children's books here at home. With the exception of books that will take longer than a typical two week checkout period. So things like reference books or longer chapter books, I will probably try to go through like thrift books or um, library book sales to acquire them. So I do tend to purchase those kind of books. I did buy the book shark reading with history, which came with a bunch of the content. Um, we haven't used it yet, so I'm not sure if that will be worth it or not, but that was, I mean, that was the option. That was just the curriculum I chose, um, came with all the content, but from a non-curriculum perspective, we are trying to curate the collection of books that we have at home to fit our goals. So for me, before purchasing any new books, I really ask myself, is this going to support a couple things? One, is this adding to the diversity and the inclusion of our library? Great, it does, we might be able to take it. <laughs> nope, it doesn't, it's just a cute little story about animals. Well, maybe we don't need it. <laughs> Um, two, the other thing that is emotional regulation. We do kind of struggle a little bit with, with regulating our emotions and identifying emotions still. So if there's a book that can help with that, that is another topic that we are willing to, um, to curate books from. And then the third kind of goal for us right now are books that we fell in love with. So sometimes we get books from the library and my kids want it over and over and over. We have great memories as a family and I'm like, this book we need, that is another reason why I would go and pick up a book because we fell in love with it after experiencing it elsewhere. But right now, I think our main goal is going to be to curate these books that really fit with our main goals for this stage in life. All right, you guys, that was it. Thank you so much for coming. Comment down below. Let me know if you have any other questions or follow-ups. I can't wait to hear more about it and I will talk to you soon. Bye everyone.